come explore the worlds of National Geographic video. This program is made possible by a grant from the people of Chevron. We're proud to bring new worlds to your world. On a rugged chain of islands scattered across an isolating sea, 200 years of insularity and 2,000 years of oriental tradition collide headlong with all that is modern, western, and international. In past ages, this resilient nation was able to retain its time-honored ways while welcoming ideas and beliefs that swept in from across the seas. Today, it struggles to preserve the ancient arts that have traditionally given richness and beauty to the lives of its people. Now as in the past, the fullness of nature provides both source and inspiration. Fusing metal with fire, a swordmaker forges a noble symbol of his nation's heritage, while a theatrical performance keeps the history of a people alive. Through these creators, the heartbeat of an ancient culture pulses through a contemporary society. Honored by their emperor, protected by their government, and revered by their countrymen, these are the living treasures of Japan. The dark mists of prehistory, the turbulent waters that sweep the coastline of Japan, divided the scattered islands from the Asian mainland. Later, like a magic carpet, these same seas carried art and architecture, scholars and warriors, the teachings of Buddha and Confucius, from China and Korea to the island empire. Conscious borrowers, the Japanese skillfully transformed foreign ideas into ways and objects which were uniquely their own. Their early political system was patterned after that of China, but power gradually shifted from the emperor to the shoguns. Determined to maintain the status quo, in 1639, the great Tokugawa shogunate closed the country to the outside world, plunging Japan into 200 years of seclusion. During the centuries of isolation, while Japan enjoyed peace and stability, an exquisite, refined aesthetic developed. In the West, modern science rushed forward, world commerce expanded dramatically, and the Industrial Revolution began. But in Japan, it was as if time stood still.
Japan's withdrawal from the world was to be abruptly changed. In 1853, tall black ships boldly flying the Stars and Stripes sailed into Tokyo Bay. A shiver of fear ran through the empire as temple bells rang out the alarm. Along the rugged shore, samurai made a great show of strength against a backdrop of antiquated cannon, and miles of curtain were rigged to hide the inadequacy of defenses from the foreigners' eyes. But the intruders were undaunted. Accompanied by some 300 troops, Commodore Matthew C. Perry went ashore to deliver a letter from United States President Fillmore to the Emperor. Couched in the polite words was the implicit demand that Japan open her doors. Perry had lit the fuse that was to propel feudal Japan into the modern world. In just 100 years, this country has transformed itself from an isolated feudal state into one of the greatest industrial societies on earth. A nation whose gross national product is third in the entire world. Yet with all its 20th century vitality, with its fervent adoption of contemporary modes, the Japanese remain resolutely Japanese. Acknowledging the need to safeguard places of historic importance, this nation, like many others, has recognized its finest as national treasures. But in a policy unique in the world, the Japanese government has selected a small number of people as worthy of protection. Officially called holders of important intangible cultural properties, they are popularly known as living national treasures. Only some 70 craftsmen and performing artists are so honored today. Each receives a small government stipend annually. With it comes great responsibility to teach, to train apprentices, to perform or exhibit, to keep the ancient crafts alive. Their creations are enjoyed by a great cross-section of people. Some are affordable by nearly everyone. Others, like fine works of art the world over, are within the reach only of museums and great collectors. Toyozo Arakawa, 87 years old, was named a living treasure for his mastery of a craft whose history stretches back thousands of years to Japan's Stone Age. In 1930, exploring deep in the rolling hills of central Japan, Arakawa discovered the ruins of a 300-year-old kiln. For centuries, distinctive pottery had been made here, but the ancient technique of creating it had vanished. Determined to revive the lost art, Arakawa built his own kiln on this historic site. Struggling for years to reproduce the old glazes and textures, he eventually triumphed crafting works of black seto and shino ware set to surpass those of earlier times.
Beneath his hands, deliberate irregularities emerge. He says, if you put too much effort into it and get too concerned about technique, the work is all the worse for it. The wheel just turns naturally of itself, and the hands move, and somehow a bowl is made. His preference for understated beauty is closely associated with Zen Buddhism, as is the tea ceremony. Called the way of tea, it was used by monks as a means of contemplation. Its function has shifted from the religious to the social, but its qualities of serenity, simplicity, and naturalness endure at the heart of the finest Japanese craftsmanship. Mr. Arakawa's son has returned to help his father in the firing that will soon take place. It is the special combination of natural glazes and white clay that will fuse to create Arakawa's famed Shino ware. Arakawa says, I surround myself with the beauty of nature to create. He believes if the artist absorbs that beauty, he can describe it in his works. Half underground, his kiln is built to catch the natural drafts that sweep the hillside. Day and night, over the next ten days, it must be attended constantly for the Shino and Seto wares sealed within to fire successfully. This is the crucial moment when Arakawa must judge if the Sato has matured. Only after he quenches the tea bowl in cold water will he know if the lustrous black glaze has oxidized properly. Expressions of the mysterious beauty that nature can create, clay and glaze, fire and water, have combined in objects that can never be duplicated. Arakawa says he makes them for his own study, though each will sell for thousands of dollars. But it is the spirit of their maker, and of the potters who created here centuries before him, that gives the works bearing the mark of Arakawa their true and lasting value. Dancing on the breeze like butterflies, lengths of newly dyed handmade paper dry in a Tokyo garden. Layer upon layer, they will be applied to the evocative, somehow mystical dolls crafted by Juzo Kagoshima.
Now 82, Kagoshima began his career at 15, working in a factory where dolls were mass-produced. But he quit, saying the plaster dolls lacked individual character, spirit, and poetry. He came to the capital and perfected his own technique, molding dolls from plant fiber and clay. His daughter and granddaughter are his apprentices. All three of them may work over a period of years to complete one of his fanciful designs. The doll making tradition he follows reaches across 4,000 years of Japanese history. Kagoshima's inventive genius is in fashioning figures with layers of paper to give them their vibrancy and depth of color. Piece by piece, tiny bits of paper are applied with a gluey, starch-like substance. A poet of renown, Kagoshima says, I started writing poems right after I started making dolls. At first sight, dolls and poems may seem different, but the difference between them is just material. Written in a fixed form of Japanese verse, one of his poems translates, In this complex world, I devote myself to the making of dolls, hoping they may turn out to be gentle, and contented. Preserving a unique Japanese art form, the dolls of Juzo Kagoshima are displayed in elegant homes, great collections, and fine museums. Classic, timeless, and hopefully, contented. During Japan's long period of isolation, an urban merchant class arose. To relax, hard-working businessmen gathered in the lively amusement quarters of the cities. Here, in Osaka's Dotonbori district, a rich theatrical tradition began that still lives 300 years later. highly developed form of puppet drama in the world, and Tamao Yoshida is at present the only puppeteer designated a living treasure. In this theater, where dolls of wood and cloth portray human life, Yoshida says, it is the artistry of revealing the hara, the inner center of emotion and spirit, that the chief puppeteer wants to attain. Three men are required to manipulate the heavy dolls that portray the main characters. Only the face of the head puppeteer can be seen. Dressed and hooded in black, 
His two assistants are accepted by the audience as invisible. This play tells of a samurai who seeks to avenge his father's murder. Today, the professional bunraku troupe of Osaka alone survives. But in the early days of the Tokugawa shogunate, there were many. Companies were summoned by emperors and shoguns for performances and honors. As Shakespeare and Moliere wrote for the actors of Europe, the leading playwrights of Japan wrote for the puppets of bunraku. It is said that the puppets, having no personalities of their own, can attain a pure intensity no actor could match. A system of toggles and pulleys makes it possible to manipulate the hand-carved heads whose mobile features eloquently express every human emotion, including jealousy. Tamao Yoshida entered the world of Bunraku at 14. Yoshida says, From the day I started until today, every day has been training, discipline, learning. And it will be study and practice until the day I die, even if I live to be a hundred. During a performance, I become the character portrayed. My spirit enters the puppet to become as one. Now 62, he has three apprentices. They will spend many years under his supervision, sharing his dressing room, his experience, his insights. When Yoshida retires or dies, his second apprentice will take his name. Yoshida says, to surpass your master pays the debt of what he gave you. Yoshida says, the artistry of portraying the depth of a man's soul, that's the puppeteer's greatest challenge. Oh. Izumo, departing clouds. These skies inspired the name of a lush and peaceful region, and the elegant handmade papers created there. Handmade papers have been used for shoji screens, imperial correspondence, as the vehicle of prayers and poetry, 
and for the sketches of artists, including Rembrandt. For perhaps a thousand years, handmade papers have been crafted in this valley. Smoothed onto boards and set outside to dry among the flower and vegetable gardens, they give the village an aura of agelessness. Here in Yakumo, Eight Cloud Village, generations of the Abe family have followed the craft. Today, Eishiro Abe, 78, still uses the ancient techniques, transforming plant fibers into exquisite handmade papers. He says, paper must be natural to be beautiful. The process begins by obtaining the inner bark of saplings. After soaking in a nearby pond, the fibers are boiled in soda ash to soften and bleach them, then rinsed in well water. One of the village ladies has worked for Abe for 50 years, others for 20 and 30 years. <laughs> Employer and employee feel a lifetime obligation to each other and their jobs. A reflection of the Japanese belief that work is a privilege. Abe's family too is involved. His wife assists as he disentangles the wood fibers. A vegetable starch mixed with the wood pulp and water will allow the bark fibers to distribute uniformly and prevent the individual sheets of paper from adhering to each other. In the year 610, a Japanese prince is said to have watched a Korean priest make paper and urged local craftsmen to master the technique. Thirteen centuries later, Mr. Abe continues to refine the method adopted by his countrymen. After draining, the sheets of paper are brushed on boards to dry. Abe's works have been appreciated in international exhibitions from Tokyo to Paris and New York. But he is one of a declining number of craftsmen still producing handmade paper. In the peaceful village of his birth, Eishiro Abe, his family, his workers, and the people of Yakumo keep an artistic tradition and an old way of life vibrantly alive. <laughs> Eleven centuries ago, the harp-like sounds of the koto drifted across the seas from China to become the music of the Japanese court. As Japan's arts flourished during the peaceful years of isolation, the Koto created a music of unprecedented popularity. Its playing became an accomplishment for the daughters of the rich commercial class 
as well as the nobility. Born to a samurai family, Fumiko Yonekawa began her musical education at age three. Now 86, she has been teaching Koto since 1917. Each summer, all of the students of Miss Yonekawa and her apprentices gather at her Tokyo studio to take part in a recital. Miss Yonekawa presides over the long day. For the young people of the contemporary world, she keeps this most traditional instrument alive. Through the hands of this woman, in an age when even Japan turns from the traditional to rock and roll, the music of a more graceful era resonates from the past into the present, and through her students will resound into the future. Japanese mythology records that three sacred objects established imperial rule on earth. The mirror of wisdom, the jewel of nobility, and the sword of strength. At a forge near Nara, Japan's first capital, Sadakazu Gasan creates sword blades according to secret ritual his ancestors followed 800 years ago. A son and grandson of masters who made swords for emperors and princes, Gassan formally took his grandfather's name in a ceremony at this Shinto shrine on Mount Miwa. Later, he built his house and forge at the foot of the mountain. Now, each morning, he prays here before beginning his day's work. Apprentices assist in the repeated pounding, heating, and tempering that gradually transform a clump of raw metal into a fine cutting blade.
To create a steel object that combines the extremes of flexibility and hardness requires layering. The exact number of times Gassan folds the metal is held a closely guarded secret. But in the pounding, folding, and fusing, more than 30,000 layers will be formed. When the blade has been shaped and ground to remove imperfections, Gassan applies clay, carbon, and whetstone powder to the surface to harden the cutting edge. And if all goes well, this curved cedar leaf pattern that is the ancient hallmark of his family will emerge on the finished blade, transmuted by the mysterious process that occurs in the final heating and quenching. The sword was once considered the soul of the samurai. In it, important Japanese values fused, the spirit of Shinto, the intuitive action of Zen Buddhism, and the service demanded by the Confucian ethic. Today, the swords of Gassan are appreciated in the timeless Japanese response to beauty. Deep in the countryside, beyond the city of Sendai, lies the Kurakoma Valley, a quiet rural district where life still moves to the ageless rhythms of nature. Here where she was born, Ayano Chiba makes indigo-dyed hemp cloth as her ancestors did, performing every step of the process from growing the plants to weaving the cloth and dyeing it. Now nearly 90, she still plants her indigo each April and covers it with straw for protection. When the tiny seeds have matured and the leaves are ready to harvest, she'll sun-dry and ferment them to create the deep blue dye. In August, she'll strip the hemp and cook the fibers, then spin them into thread. Probably the only one left who performs the entire weaving and dyeing procedure these days. She and her daughter can spin just enough thread to weave four or five bolts of kimono cloth a year. And in Mrs. Chiba's words, that's a lot of thread to weave. A cheerful person by nature, she seems happiest here. Her days at the loom began when she was only 14 years old. These days, she says she awakens at 4 a.m. and just waits for morning's first light so she can begin weaving.
Mrs. Chiba weaves throughout the year. Dyeing is done in summer. As a girl, she watched her parents and grandparents use indigo. But she did not begin to dye cloth until she was 34. Today, her 60-year-old daughter is her apprentice, and her great-great-grandson watches them. The cloth is dipped time and again to absorb the deep blue indigo. Then, four generations join Mrs. Chiba at the river to rinse the cloth, as it has been done since time beyond memory. When properly rinsed, Mrs. Chiba's fabric will be color fast. She says it will last over a hundred years, its color only deepening with age. Just as in the old days, says Mrs. Chiba, just as in the old days. <laughs> Tokyo was probably the world's largest city during Japan's 200 years of isolation. Kabuki theater, patronized by the new merchant class, eventually surpassed even the puppet theater in popularity. Today, it is Japan's favorite classical theater, and Tokyo's Kabukiza, the stage of the celebrated actor Utaemon Nakamura. In a theatrical world where the names of great actors are bestowed upon worthy successors, he is the sixth generation to bear this illustrious stage name. <laughs> Son of a noted actor, he entered the demanding world of Kabuki when he was only five years old. The actor's arduous day begins as he checks in at the stage door and pays his respects at the theater's shrine. Kabuki dates from an entertainment begun by a priestess at the turn of the 17th century. But the shogunate feared the effect of the performances on the morality of audiences. In 1629, attempting to protect public morals, the government banned Kabuki performances by women. From that time, all Kabuki parts have been played by males. considered by many to be the greatest of today's onagata, Utaemon has spent a lifetime perfecting his stylized concept of womanhood, and the name Utaemon draws crowds of faithful admirers. Now 64 years old, Utaemon believes female impersonation is not merely imitation of woman and her behavior, but stresses the essential nature and beauty of which women themselves are not fully aware.
In the stylized conventions of Kabuki, the story unfolds through dance and dialogue to the accompaniment of a narrator and musicians. This play is about the rivalry of two warlords. In an attempt to make peace, the shogun ordered a marriage arranged between the daughter of one and the son of the other. Believing her betrothed has been killed, she pours out her emotions in dance. But the fiancé is alive, posing as a gardener in her father's household. She falls in love with him and is overcome when she discovers his true identity. Her father, a clever man, is not deceived. Making the gardener his envoy, the father dispatches him on an errand and will send an assassin after him. Like many kabuki plays, this was originally written for bunraku, and the actor's movements pay homage to the puppets. artistry of Utaemon Nakamura, an old and honored theatrical name and tradition, live on in the heart of Tokyo, one of the 20th century's busiest modern cities. Only 30 miles from Tokyo's hectic streets, the parishioners of Noninji Temple gather on a day the ancient Buddhist almanac declares to be auspicious. After a ceremony of benediction in which prayers are offered that their temple's new bell will bring them happiness, its maker, Masaiko Katori, rings the bell symbolically giving it to the temple. The bell, like all those of Katori's creation, was forged in Takaoka, a busy industrial city that is the home of Japan's largest foundry for handmade metal works. Mr. Katori says, each bell has its own spirit, its own personality. Working from his original design, he carves scenes from the life of Buddha into a section of the mold from which a new bell will be cast. These sections of outer mold are formed of clay encased in iron shells and eventually joined together. Then, they are lowered over the inner mold.
bronze for the bell will be poured between inner and outer molds. Priests from the temple that has commissioned it are here to pray for the creation of a bell whose sound will bring peace of mind to the listener. Offerings of flowers and persimmons, sake and squid are made to Buddha and a paper prayer acknowledges the Shinto deities of the forge. Copper plates bearing the names of parishioners who have made donations and prayers written on paper are added to become part of them. <laughs> Mr. Katori says part of the spirit of the bell is the wishes and prayers that the people who make it put into it. The bell must cool for 12 hours before it can be determined if the casting has been successful. Katori must wait. In early morning, he returns to the forge. By tradition, the bell will be rung only once to test it before it is hung at the temple that commissioned it. But first, Clinging bits of clay are removed. Mr. Katori says the most difficult thing in the creation of a bell is finding the right form. His experience is that a beautiful shape gives a beautiful tone. sound of the bell, the voice of Buddha. This is Mr. Katori's 96th bell. Others ring out from Japan's most revered temples, foreign lands, and Hiroshima, where the peace bell was his personal gift to the city and the world. The voices of his bells carry his hopes for peace over the earth. In the creations of the living treasures, there is something each hopes will touch the soul of the user, the viewer, the listener. Through their hands, hearts, and minds, these great masters pass forward the torch of a unique artistic heritage that their talents may live beyond their numbered days on earth.
Ayano Chiba was one of the original living treasures of Japan. On March 29, 1980, she died. This film is dedicated to her memory and to all the living treasures who illuminate the future with the timeless spirit of their nation's past. National Geographic video. If she wasn't so feared, she wouldn't have to hide. If survival came easy, she wouldn't have to kill. And when she hungers, Africa knows no greater fury. Living in solitude, stalking in silence, she walks in mystery. National Geographic presents an intimate portrait of a mother and her young. Venture into the lair of the secret leopard. National Geographic video, undeniably collective and affordably priced, only from Vestron Video.